Hello, Microbial Nation, and welcome to another episode of The Micro Moment, that show that takes you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess. And I'm John. And I'm Julie. And welcome to 2023. I know we're probably pretty far into the year now, and you're probably not allowed to say Happy New Year any bit more, but let me just go ahead and tell you all Happy New Year. And we hope 2023 is better than 2022, and we've been going up since 2020, so may that trend continue. Yeah, I don't think it's that late. I mean, this is the first episode of the year, so... I don't know. Someone yelled at me the other day and said it's way too late to be wishing Happy New Year, but I'm like, well, it's still Happy New Year, right? Yeah. Well, it it was just Chinese New Year, so... Yeah, it's Lunar Year of the Rabbit. Mm-hmm. Lunar New Year. <laughs> Apparently, I'm a rabbit. I checked today. Are We're you monkeys. really? Yep. Oh. 1987. Hmm. That explains some things. Does it? Does it really? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> well, well, you and I are monkeys, so... I know. Which is why I'm so silly. That's why you like to monkey around. Yeah. And that you were born the year that I was a freshman in college is quite depressing. And now I'm way past freshman of college, which is also still very depressing. But regardless of how old we are, maybe let's get into a little bit of astro microbiology. This will be our final segment in astro microbiology. So if you are looking for more astro microbiology, you haven't listened to our previous season on it. We had a recording with Jennifer Blanc. Blanc? Yep, Dr. Blanc. Dr. Blanc. We did two episodes on science fiction of sci fi, which one of them ended up being completely Star Trek. Not that we're Trekkies, but. That's just what it happened. Yes, we are. We're probably a little bit of Trekkies. Mm-hmm. We just played some 4D chess, and that's accidentally how it happened. Yeah. And uh, do we have anything else with Astro? Oh, we did an intro to Astro Microbiology, I think. Yeah. In, in the very beginning. So, per usual, we are here today to close out our segment of Astro Microbiology with a da bomb, the best of microbiology. Specifically, today we will discuss three different papers, recent papers, or articles that we found that is about astromicrobiology in three different areas. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. We hope you will learn a little something new. Before we dive into the papers, I wanted to ask you guys, what was your biggest takeaway from all the episodes we've done in astromicrobiology? I have to say my big takeaway is how much we're studying Earth itself as a proxy to study possible life out there. Mm. Or how close Earth is to other environments in space. Right, because, you know, when when you think of outer space, you're just thinking, like, outside of Earth. But the only accessible thing is Earth. So most of the research is here. It's a lot cheaper, that's for sure. Very true. <laughs> I think my my big takeaway is just how much we don't know, like how much there is left to explore, like here on Earth and out there in space. Uh, so I think it's just going to be a never ending journey of discovery for microbes and all kinds of stuff. Job security for life and for generations to come. I really enjoyed learning about Spot, the little robot that Jennifer Blanc got to um talk to us about and all the different ways that these was it boston dynamics yeah and, and all the different ways boston dynamics is using these little robots not only in science but in a lot of different areas as well i thought that was really fascinating yeah and it doesn't really do it a hundred percent justice until you watch the video and see the video how cool. was incredible yeah if you haven't watched the video yet go check that out because uh, Boston Dynamics has got some really, I mean, they're almost like little dogs. Like you want to pet them. They're adorable. No, I really think that's how other planet exploration is going to be eventually. Once they make sure that those robots are hardy enough and they can strap like a, a nuclear battery on there, I think we'll be able to study Mars a lot more and faster than yeah. what we have been. Are those the ones that they have at the Boston Museum of Science? probably they're like little yellow they look like dogs they have four legs yeah a yellow like body they, they have them at the boston museum of science and they have them like in this little glass case and they they run through this little thing and they have like a course and and they like go up these stairs and then they 
go around like a thing. And I could have just sat there and watched it for hours. It was just, it was so cool. Um, and, and just the, the way that it moved was so lifelike. Yeah. I, it's, it's incredible. I'm so excited to see where that science goes and where Jennifer Blanc's science goes using spot and other Boston dynamic robots. Wait, I have some breaking news. What's that? There you go. <laughs> right now at 7.27 p.m., 2023BU, which is a new asteroid that they just discovered a couple of days ago, is passing by the Earth right now, and it's one of the closest ones that has ever gone by at 2,200 miles from the surface of our planet. What? Can we see it? Why are we recording a podcast? Let's get outside. And, oh, I don't know if we can see it. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, I thought that was pretty exciting news while we're talking about it. And they just uh, discovered it. And it's going to be passing over the southern tip of South America at 727, which is right now. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I guess we'll probably find some pictures online. Yeah, it's. I guess it's fairly small. Well, sort of small, 30 feet across, about the size of a truck. And it looks like Chile, southern Chile, is going to be getting the uh, the show. Well, lucky them. If anyone out there is in southern Chile and they see it, send us a pic. I'm really excited to see that. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. But there is no danger to the to the Earth, they said. Even though it's it's close by space standards, it's not that close. Yeah, right. And it's pretty small, so... But interesting that they only discovered it a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. Like they had no idea. And now it's going to be one of the things that have passed us by the closest thing. So I think that was sort of scary, I think, (laughs) that they don't discover it. Yeah. So what's what's that? One of our favorite movies there with the uh, Armageddon. Armageddon. Yeah. Don't want to close your eyes. Yeah. Copyright. Copyright. (laughs) That was less than three seconds. We're fine. All right. right. Cool, cool, cool. Also, like, hats off to amateur astronomists because they're the ones that are finding most of the asteroids out there. Mm Mm-hmm. Just like in Don't Look Up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The the one who discovered this one is Gennady Borisov in Crimea. Mm. And I guess he has discovered some other ones as well. So I I wonder when you... You graduate from being an amateur astronomer to, like, what's the, what's the professional level? I don't know. Some people say you have to have a degree, but I feel like those thoughts are becoming less necessary. Yeah, if anyone out there knows, like, it is it a hobby where you can actually, there's different levels? Let us know. So, should we dive into our papers that we have today? Who wants to go first? I can go. All right, Julie will go first. All right, well, this is an article that I found in uh, the Smithsonian Magazine where the title is Scientists Discovered Exposed Bacteria Can Survive in Space for Years, which I thought was quite fascinating. So picture this. The background is the, the dark, lifeless space and a white robotic arm against that darkness is moving around the International Space Station. It has a small box, actually three small, well, a box with several things in it. Um, And it places it on the handrail of the International Space Station, which is about 250 miles above the Earth. So the contents of this box are gonna be exposed to an onslaught of cosmic ultraviolet gamma and X-rays, the cold of space, the pressure of space, the radiation. The vacuum. The vacuum, yep. What could possibly survive? Anybody have any guesses? Dinococcus radiance. (laughs) Aw, man! I can't fool you guys. You guys know everything. (laughs) We do a lot of research on microbes all the time. (laughs) I guess. I was pretty excited. I'd never heard of them, but I'm not going to let you steal my thunder. I'm going to keep going. Yeah, yeah, you go, you go. All right. So the winner here are, in a more generic sense, 
extremophiles. And we've talked about on, on the show a couple of times about how scientists have been studying extremophiles for a long time um, in all kinds of different places. And I think, Alicia, you're going to talk about this in a little bit. But I, I think I talked about it a while back about, you know, uh, microbes that can live in hot springs or way under the ocean where the, the pressure is really deep. So in this case, they've been studying those and, and they think that by studying these, you can kind of get a little more of an idea of how life evolved and, and how things have happened here on Earth. So now with this little experiment that they did on the International Space Station, astromicrobiologists are studying these extremophiles um, outside of that. And what they have found, um, and they found these were published in uh, Frontiers in Microbiology, which sounds like a really cool um, publication. This one time I submitted there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a publication, Frontiers Micro. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty, uh, I liked the name. Of course, Frontiers always means Star Trek to me, but mm -hmm. um, so I'm ex I'm picturing that it's a very cool and modern spacey of course it has a paper i authored it's oh well, yeah cool. so now i like it even more <laughs> and overall it's a good journal it is a good journal yeah yeah well so the this was published a, a couple years old now but what they have found is that you know some microbes can last you know a little bit a couple of days um, which is of course way longer than we could survive out in space. Any, do you guys know how long we would last with no protection? Seconds? Yeah, I, I don't think it's very long. Is this with or without a compression suit? Without. Uh, yeah, yeah like seconds, seconds probably. Yeah. In all the movies where I've ever seen every, anybody put out the space lock, it doesn't, it doesn't look like it ends well. Unless you're Princess Leia and then you can overcome anything. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's been a couple that have tried it, but uh, yeah, so they they can last way longer than us. And and actually tardigrades, they think, um, or they know, can last up to 10 days So uh, in space. So that's, it's pretty cool. The idea of this was that one of the labs in Japan, they prepared for this. And, and you are totally right about the Dinococcus radi, how do you say it? I think it's a radiodurans. Radiodurans. Um, and what they have found is they can last up to uh, three years in space. Three they years? Kind of, yeah. Did they actually have them out there for three years? And then yeah, that's a long experiment. At first, when they were designing the experiment, they did it in the lab at first. So they weren't too surprised that there was a good amount of success because they blasted you know them on earth so in a lab they blasted them with radiation they dropped the pressures they swung temperatures 140 degrees fahrenheit in 90 seconds and they survived so they kind of thought that that they would do okay so what they did is they sent you know in this box they have they had different levels different you know plates basically or panels um and they sent one was for one year, one was for two years, one was for three years. And once a year, the robot arm would go out and get it and bring it back in and they would take samples of it. They had already they had always known that like if the microbes can get like inside a rock and kind of protect itself, they could last a little bit longer. But these microbes were totally exposed. There wasn't any protection for them at all. And really interestingly, what happened is that the outer layers of the microbes, basically, they did die, but they were able to protect the inner layers of the microbes. So they they kept those inner ones alive, and the and the radiation, which is about two hundred times what it is here on Earth, they kept those alive. And the other thing that this particular microbe has, which is interesting and unique to it, um, do you know how many copies? that humans carry of DNA? Most most bacteria only carry one. How many do humans have? It's like two, right? We have pairs. Yep. So we have two. This particular microbe has 10. Wow. It's like a yeah, strawberry. So, yeah. So it's really <laughs> unique. And that, that helps it because 10 copies, it can create more of the proteins 
that can be used to fix the DNA that gets damaged by the, the radiation. And so they think that's a big reason why, you know, these are able to to survive. It's a little bit of a redundancy too, right? If you have extra copies, like you can probably lose like a copy and still be fine. Yeah, but it's a lot of energy, a lot of resources to uptake all that DNA. It's a hardy microbe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it probably wasn't living its best life, but, you know, it was alive. And so I think one of the really fascinating things that they are assuming from this is that if this particular bacteria or one like it that, you know, kind of had some of these traits, you know, extra copies of DNA so it could repair itself better, um, just that the resistance to those elements. So what they think is that bacteria in some form, microbes in some form, could have survived the two to eight year journey that it would have taken for um, like maybe an asteroid of some kind to get from Mars to the Earth. So they, they're like, well, we kind of have to expand how we think life came to the Earth because if something could survive a journey between Mars and the Earth, maybe it came from Mars. So maybe we're all Martians. Mm -hmm. What's that theory? There's a specific theory for that. Panspermia, I Panspermia, believe. Panspermia, yeah. Yeah. Have either of you taken a look up uh, a look at pictures of Dianococcus radiorans? Probably. It's kind of weird looking. It's like a you know if you look at a an egg that's fertilized, it looks like the first couple of cell divisions of it. So a pretty simple shape. Yeah, huh. no, it's it's pretty unique looking. I haven't really seen microbes look like it, so I suggest anyone out there take a look at it. It's pretty cool looking. Yeah, we'll put it on our uh, Facebook page, our Instagram page, and our Twitter page. Yeah, and so that's that's what I have for you tonight. Cool. Microbes that survive space. That's fun. And could be the beginnings of life here on Earth. We don't know. Or the beginnings of life on other Earths. Mm-hmm. Could like be. planets. Cool. Well, John, should I go next with my extremophile thing, or should we sandwich the extremophiles in uh, what you have? Uh, let's go with you next. All right. So mine is also about extremophiles, but here on Earth a little bit more. I read a paper called Microbial Motility at the Bottom of North America, Digital Holographic Microscopy and Genomic Motility Signatures in Badwater Spring Death Valley National Park. Could you unpack that a little bit? That was a mouthful. It certainly was. I mean, these papers are always quite a mouthful. Um, yeah, so basically we're talking about motility as a biosignature for life, um, specifically in one of the world's harshest, most, well, I don't know if I would say most extreme, but um, one of the world's most harshest, most extreme environments in Death Valley, which has the lowest point in North America and also has some of the hottest temperatures ever on record. Can you define what motility is? Like movement. Um, so I'll go in a little bit into how microbes, how different microbes move. But they're really asking the question if uh, it moves, is it alive? And if we can say that, can we use movement as a way to find life on other planets? Can, can I ask a question which may or may not be a spoiler? Yes. Do you talk about the moving rocks? No, I do not talk about the moving rocks of Death Valley. Oh, well, they move. Are they alive? Well, th I mean, that's sort of the thing, right? So other things, but the the their movement is different. Yeah, it's it's very different. It's very different. We're not going to get into that. But anyways, this comes to us uh, from some people. The lead author being Carl Snyder and the corresponding author by being Brian P. Headland. And there is about 10 other authors on this paper as well. So as I kind of mentioned, this article sets out to answer three main questions with direct relation to life on Earth and also on other planets. These three questions they aim to answer are one. Movement is a part of a signature of life. We all move and many microbes move too. Not all of them, but many of them do. So how can we use this idea of movement to detect extraterrestrial life? The second question they went out to discover is what is the microbial diversity in extreme environments? Specifically, they looked at the brine pools in Badwater Springs and Death Valley National Park. Brine, of course, being salt. So it's very salty 
pools of water, pools of liquid in a very extreme environment of Death Valley. We were there. We were there, yeah. And I think I've Death, been there. Death Valley this year is supposed to have another like wicked big super bloom. So if you are in the area, it does seem like it's going to be a good time to visit them. To visit Death I was Valley there for a super experience. bloom. It was it was very cool. Yeah, we were too. Yeah. And I tasted the salt on the ground in Bad Waters. It wasn't very good. I don't think you're supposed to say that. Well, it was for science. <laughs> I think it's illegal. <laughs> And then the final question they tried to answer was, in these extreme environments, which we often use as a proxy for otherworldly environments, how widespread is movement in these environments of the microbial communities? And can we use that as, again, a proxy for other worlds? So let's talk about the first question. How can we detect the movement of extraterrestrial life? A running theme in this segment, as we've talked about on this podcast and in previous episodes within the season, is if we do discover extraterrestrial life, it's likely to be microbial. And how we detect microbes is often pretty hard. We can't see them with our naked eye. We usually have to either grow them on media, we have to sequence them, uh, but then that assumes that their basis of life is DNA. Or we can use microscopes. And under microscopes, we can actually see our microbial friends. But microscopes are fragile. They're complicated. They're heavy. They have a lot of moving parts. And they require experts to operate, which leaves it kind of as a hard choice when we're talking about going out to explore other worlds and trying to image things. Well, Snyder and colleagues taught me something new about microscopy. They found this little loophole, this new, or it's not really even new because I was looking it up. It kind of came up in the 1960s and was more perfected in the early 2000s. But it's this idea of digital holographic microscopes. And I was watching this video today on YouTube. Um, I forget who the creator was. But he actually tried to create a digital holographic microscope using just three pieces of equipment. So he had a Raspberry Pi, he had an LED light, and then he had a 3D printed lens. You say Raspberry Pi? Yes, it's a computer thing. It's like a little computer chip. It's it's very small. Okay, well, I was picturing like apple pie no, no, no. and meringue no, no, no. pie. No? no? Okay. Many, yeah, no, not like that. It's a computer thing, um, which I thought was really cool that with just three things, you could build your own microscope. He then later went on to show some images that weren't that clear, and he had a second version that had a lot more parts made from a 3D printer. He also wasn't able to get super clear images out of that, but I still think it was really creative and innovative for him to go out and try to make one of these digital holographic microscopes. One of the advantages that this digital holographic microscope has from other microscopes is it doesn't have as many moving parts. It has no compound objective lenses. It takes a recording of a specific spot and sends it into the computer, and the computer can make your images for you. When, so when the micro crosses paths with the camera, in the, view, in the viewpoint of the camera, the microscope records it as a hologram into the computer, and you can image it. It's actually in 4D is one place that I saw it, because you get the 3D plus time. So that's where the, the fourth dimension comes from, I suppose. So I have a question about this. Yes. Is it like a... Good quality. Is it like a high resolution image so that you can like zoom in to possibly see microbial life or am I completely missing the... So they were using it specifically to record movement of microbial life. They did have some images in the paper. They weren't super clear. I mean, it's not like an SEM, which I always forget what that stands for, but it's a super wicked focus microscope. Okay. So you're not able to get into like the cellular parts of the cell, but you can see the cell and you can see its movement. Okay. Again, I haven't seen too many super clear images from these microscopes. They're definitely not replacing a lot of the microscopes that you have in labs and some of the more fancy equipment that they have in cores. But it was kind of cool. It was about the size of a boom box, I want to say, to take these. So they could take this microscope to Death Valley and do some recordings 
at the actual site, which I think makes it nice to that transfer to maybe putting it on a, a spaceship and sending it to space. And if people have not gone out to, I don't know, you can see a lot of it on like Instagram and stuff. The people who are doing stuff with like those fancy microscopes you were talking about, like at the cellular level, and they do art and they do all this stuff. It's really fascinating. And they they can show like the cilia moving and stuff. It's really fascinating. And you can see all the different cell parts. And it's if you've never been out there looking, uh, I highly suggest it because it really is fascinating. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about movement. So motility, movement, as we call it. Uh, There's lots of different ways that motility happens in microbes. Uh, Movement is useful for a number of reasons. Uh, It's definitely great for survival to move towards food or away from becoming food. However, microbes do move different from us. They don't have legs. And they have very different ways of moving from each other. So even within the microbial world, they all kind of move differently. Some bacteria will have hair-like structures called flagella. So this is one form, one mechanism of movement is with the flagella. There are also tiny hairs that will come all the way around the body. Uh, These are cilia or ciliates. These are another way of swimming through environments. And then some microbes have filamentous um, fungi also have filaments that they can shoot out. And when they create these filaments, they're little small thread-like structures. And when they put little kinks in these filaments, it will end up changing the direction and moving the whole, whole cell. So with all these different ways and different structures that microbes have, they are able to swim, glide, slide, twitch, and swarm through their environments. And each of these creates a distinct pattern, which you can almost put an algorithm to. You can calculate it. So that's kind of what they were doing, is looking at these different forms of movement. All of these different forms of movement are different from, say, the way those moving rocks move in Death Valley. These are ways that biotic forms are moving. So they can put it into an algorithm, and then they can scan the recordings to see how many times they're actually seeing any of these kinds of movements. They estimated that about 960 microbes were found per microliter at the site that they were in, in Death Valley. And if you don't know what a microliter is, here's a slightly crazy number for you. 5,000 microliters is what unit of measurement that you have in your house. 5,000 microliters. Mm-hmm. You measure. One cup? Nope, much smaller. Mm, a tablespoon? Smaller. Teaspoon? A teaspoon. 5,000 microliters is one teaspoon. So if we convert the microbes that they found to teaspoons, you'll have roughly 4.8 million microbes in that teaspoon. That's a lot. It's more than the human population of Louisiana. In case you're wondering, what's up, Louisiana? They estimated that only of this, through their digital holographic microscope, they estimated that 2.6% of these cells were modal, which I thought was a really small number. 2.6? 2.6, yeah. Oh, percent. That is a small number. Right. So if we're saying like, oh, we want to use movement to find extraterrestrial life, it's like, well, if only 2.6 of microbes can do it, that's really not a great biosignature. So, but also I feel like that's a small number. I think more microbes are modal. Yeah, I would think more microbes are modal. I would think like a certain percentage are relying on the winds of Death Valley to get around. Right, there's a lot of drift and, and dispersion. and The sand dunes mm-hmm. in Death Valley. Yeah, and it's also limited by the number of times they recorded and where they recorded and how long they recorded because not everything wants to move all the time. That's a lot of energy to move. It really is. It's so hard for me to get off the couch sometimes. I know, getting out of bed. Oh, it's rough stuff. Anyways, I do think that number is a little low and we'll get to some of their other estimates that actually 
um, goes in a slightly different direction. But first, let's get into their second question that they try to answer with this paper. And this is, what is the microbial diversity in extreme environments like the brine pools in Badwater Springs in Death Valley National Park? In today's era, microbial diversity is explored through sequencing of the DNA. There are two distinct forms of microbial community exploration through sequencing. There is what's called amplicon sequencing and metagenomics. In amplicon, you look at a single gene that is found across all the microbes. You can think of this sort of like the fingerprinting you see in forensics. So in forensics, they use fingerprints all the time to try to identify people for crimes or as victims or in a lot of other situations. This fingerprint is just a tiny, teensy little bit of a person, but everyone has one. And yet they are different enough to distinguish them between. So this is very much like amplicon sequencing. It's a fingerprinting of the microbial world in a location. It's looking for something that is similar amongst all microbes, but different enough to differentiate them. But what fingerprint doesn't tell you is anything about the person beyond the identity. A fingerprint, a fingerprint can pull up a person's name. Maybe you get their address. Maybe you get past crimes if it's they're already in the system. But it doesn't tell you if this person can play the violin or has brown eyes, or likes to read on the weekends. It doesn't tell you anything about the function of the microbe. This is where metagenomics comes in. This is a much broader type of sequencing that aims to assemble the full genome of the microbes in the system and understand not only who they are, but what they do. But it's extremely computational heavy. It can be much more expensive than amplicon sequencing. But those prices are coming down. Computational costs are coming down. We're going to see this sort of analysis happening a lot more. And we will find out so much about our microbial friends through metagenomics. Right. And metagenomics is kind of like you said that uh, amplicon sequencing is like fingerprinting. Metagenomics is Filling out that picture a lot more, you know, like what are the facial features of that person, um, hair color, maybe the metabolism of the person, mm-hmm. stuff like that, but on a microbial level. Yeah, exactly. But really for sequencing to work in sort of an extraterrestrial search, we have to assume that those extraterrestrials, the organisms we find in outer space are DNA-based life forms. And we've discussed previously on the podcast, we talked about carbon-based life forms and the potential that that could not happen. So DNA is not a given in other parts of the galaxy. But by coupling sort of sequencing technology that we have here and this concept of digital holographic microscopy, we can kind of get an idea at least of what is in this Death Valley brine pools. That's really cool because even in like microbiology setting, even for like human health, they use motility to distinguish different microbes. Yeah. I mean, lots of microbes move differently. They'll move at different speeds. They'll move in different patterns and It can be a, I never really thought of it, but it is kind of a cool biosignature to think about. Yeah. If I remember in my micro class, you could do this thing where you like, you have this little like needle, you stick it into a culture and then you stick it into agar, you let it grow and then you can see like these lines shooting out and it shows like the movement of the microbe over time. Yeah. The classic clinical microbiology tests. So why Death Valley? Why do they choose Death Valley? Besides it being a pretty extreme environment and a space I assume that they were able to get to, as not all extreme environments are easy to get to, uh, they had these brine pools, which are wicked salty, and they said that it was similar to cryovolcanoes in Europa, which I'm like, what is a cryovolcano? Seems like an oxymoron. Is it an ice volcano? I know, but like, what is an ice volcano? Um, It shoots ice instead of lava. Is that real life right now? I think so, yeah. Europa spews out like I, uh, water slash ice from the inside. Somehow that's far more terrifying than lava. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
seeing ice shards in my future. It's also very close to Mars. Some places on Mars have very similar qualities as well to Death Valley. So there are some proxies of Death Valley to some known environments out in space. Well, I'm not really sure I agreed with all the methods that they used in this paper. They did amplicon sequencing. They did metagenomics and some of the methods and the nitty gritty. I was a little hazy on. Uh, I do like the way that they had a pretty deep dive into the literature, which often you don't see. So most of the things that they were pulling out, they were cross-checking against the literature, which again has its limitations um, because the literature is only what we know and not what is unknown. I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not, it doesn't cover everything that is there. You're kind of putting yourself in a little box of what we already knew in the past, which often can lose your way to discovering something new in the future. But I did kind of like that because a lot of times we don't see deep dives into the literature. So they pulled out a lot of microbes from their 16S, which they then cross-referenced with the literature to determine whether or not they had motility. They came up with Ralstonia was the biggest microbe that had this motility, but there was also Tristrella, called a Trichiaceae disulfobacterium, disulfovibrio, Spirocadia, Leptospiriaceae, Sphingomondiaceae, Vermifiliaceae and the Burkledoria cabelleronia paraburkledoria complex, which cannot be dif- distinguished with 16S analysis. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Yeah. Now that we're done with that gibberish. I do have to say, though, like one of my favorite names is for bacteria is Sphingo. Just the way that sounds Sphingo kind of makes me chuckle inside a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You're a nerd. I love you for it. Back at you, kid. Aww. So they looked at these different abundances of these microbes that they found were modal in literature and looked at the abundances that they had in their 16S. And they also came to the decision that 2.6 seemed pretty low. Uh, This is heavily extrapolated, of course, with their 16S data. You can't really determine abundance through that. But from this genetic analysis, they think that the number of motile microbes should actually be closer to 14 to 57 percent, which is a big range. But I feel like in my gut and my microbes in my gut, they're telling me that's a lot closer to the real range in environments than 2.6. I don't really know. Just my gut, my microbes are talking to me. They say that's probably closer. Yeah, I I agree. It may have been harder because I assume that the diversity, this is just an assume, that the diversity of Death Valley may be not as abundant as some other environments just because of how extreme it is. Oh, you'd be surprised in my early findings in some of the extreme environments that I study. I'm surprised at the diversity that I'm finding. Really? I, I did not think that I would find so, so much diversity, but... It's much greater than I thought it would be. I guess I'm wrong. But I think like these extreme environments are so undersampled. We don't really know. We don't really know what the turnover rate or how stable these microbial environments are, how often they're going to change or how different they are from one meter away to 16 meters away. I think there's lots of fun things to do in these extreme environments as far as science goes. Well, and I think it's also going to depend on the tools, right? Like... The tools we have today, you know, in 50 years, maybe they'll have even better tools to see more stuff. Right. And also, the this is stuff that they fed into a computer, right? So it's only as good as the computer program. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's all against the database. Um, and they only went to the family level, which is pretty high on... Um, I, I wish I had an analogy for you guys because I'm usually pretty good about that. But family level is pretty high up on the classification of microbes. <laughs> so I do think that the digital holographic microscopy is highly under, underestimating microbial movement. The genetics sort of suggests that it's much higher, but the genetics I don't think is super accurate either. But it is a pretty interesting tool to detect something, right? I mean, it could be used to find movement in soils from other planets or even just life on our own planet. It is a pretty unique tool that is low in the space that it needs and the equipment that's necessary to operate it. 
in the expertise that's needed to operate it. So I thought that was pretty interesting, which I think all wraps up to our final question that they try to answer. Brings us back to that third and final question. How widespread is movement in the microbes that live in extreme environments? So I ask you two those questions. Do you think they answered it or there's still a lot of work to do? Or is movement a good tool for our biosignature? I mean, I can't tell if it's a good biosignature, but I think it's a novel way to look for life and on other planets. Like like you said, you know, it's possible that other life may not have DNA or at least the the classical version of what we think of here on Earth. So it isn't it'd be a possible way to try to find life on other planets. Yeah, I mean, we don't know what is out there. So the more different ways that we can think of life and detecting it, I think the better off we are to actually discovering if there is life out there besides us. Right. And there, there's been arguments of like, well, other missions to Mars, what if we are able to run a PCR to try to amplify DNA? Well, if life doesn't have the DNA that we think of, we may never be able to amplify any DNA or mm-hmm. see it. So this might be an alternative to that. Yeah. I think as long as it's not absolute, right? Like as long as you don't say, oh, it has to move or it's not alive. Because I think that that's, you know, I think it's a a good tool to apply with along with other yeah, tools. for sure. We definitely need multiple tools. And there's always exceptions to the rules. And when we don't even know what the rules would be in life that we don't even know what exists, we definitely need all the tools that we can get. And I just want to kind of end the segment on this paper by saying I have some critical comments on this paper, but it's not meant to say that they did a bad job or that we shouldn't believe in the results or sort of the idea of movement as a biosignature. Science is really hard and people are doing science the best they can. I think typically they don't have a lot of funding. They don't have a lot of resources. uh, And I'm really grateful for these authors for teaching me about digital holographic microscopy, which I I never knew existed before reading this paper. And I'm also really grateful for the thought exercise that they've given me and us uh, on how movement can be used as a biosignature or should it be used as a biosignature for life on other planets. Well, it is how science moves forward, right? With critical thinking as far as you know, people don't always think you sometimes you get too deep into something, you can't really see your way around. So you got to rely on other people to kind of see some of that stuff. So I would imagine most scientists have to, while it might sting a bit, it must be like critical to the process. Yeah, but uh, I mean, a lot of times people are too critical. People try hard in science. I I have to give these this uh team credit. This is I would say this is thinking way outside the box at least normally. Yeah, I think they're really trying to think of things and do science in ways that people haven't done previously and in areas that a lot of science hasn't been done before. So, That's how we move forward? How we move forward slowly. And I'm sure they didn't have a lot of funding for something like this, so they had to Use their funding wisely. Yeah. All right, John, what are you going to teach us about today? So this one is kind of a, a perspective article It from a scientist. They wrote an article, There Could Be Life on Hot Volcanic Io, Jupiter's Pizza Moon. Did you say Pizza Moon? Yes, Pizza Moon. Why so, is it called a Pizza Moon? So I want the two of you to look up Io. Right now? Right now. It's going to be a lot of clicking. Uh, it'll be quick. How do I spell it? I-O. What? It's not that that <laughs> much typing. <laughs> Slightly larger than the Earth's moon, I-O is the fourth largest moon in the solar system and has the highest density. Kind of reminds me of space balls. There's pizza in space balls, right? Uh, there is something about pizza. Monster? A pizza monster in something space like balls? That. I'm going to look it up. But yeah, it's yellow, pizza red, the hut. and orange. Yes. Mm-hmm. See? But yeah, it's red, yellow, and orange. So they call it the pizza moon. 
It was named after the mythological character Io, a priestess of Hera, who became one of Zeus's lovers. And a mm. lover of pizza. So says Wikipedia. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this article was by Dr. Dirk Schultz Makuch. And I do apologize if I am butchering that name. And that goes for all names that we say on the podcast. We do try, but names are hard. Yeah. And this was uh, mid-January and on the website bigtalk.com. It is mid-January. Oh, it's late January. Okay, yeah, it's in January. It's really recent. It is really recent. So what is Io? So we already alluded a little bit. It is one of Jupiter's moons. It also turns out to be the most volcanically active place in our solar system. How volcanically active is that? It may have an ocean of magma that stretches across the moon. And there's what? 100 yeah. active volcanoes, according to Wikipedia again. Yes. How many active volcanoes does Earth have? Not that much. But that kind of goes into my next thing is you can see an image from the Juno spacecraft. This is a spacecraft from NASA that has been studying Jupiter for the past six to seven years. And its primary mission was to study the planet's atmosphere and interior. But the mission's length has been extended to continue studying Jupiter as well as the moons orbiting it. Yeah, NASA. The spacecraft took an infrared image of Io showing it completely pockmarked with active volcanoes. And these volcanoes can be so violent that some of the eruptions can reach hundreds of miles into space. What? Yeah. Wait, a hundred miles? Yeah. Just shooting lava? Shooting lava. And sulfur. And sulfur. Well, that sounds like a lovely little holiday. Yeah. So, like, the sulfur rains down like snow there. Aw, so pretty. I think it would be unsafe for... Earth visitors because they'd be trying to take selfies on the edge of the volcano and got to get that get sulfur shot. shot. Yeah, need that sulfur shot selfie. Yeah, and this moon may have once had water, possibly similar to Europa, which you had mentioned, because it resides in the area of the solar system that was plentiful of ice. But most to all of the water has been lost over millions to billions of years. And this is because of Jupiter's radiation that it emits, as well as a phenomenon called tidal heating, which may be partially what caused Europa's volcanic eruption or ice volcano. This is a process where gravity from the other moons and the planet squish and stretch the moon to the point of warming it up. So it's constantly under this pressure of being stretched and smushed. So I'm wondering if that's how Europa has uh, its ice volcanoes. I don't know. That just seems super cartoony for a planet to be squashed and mushed and stretched. And it, It's really hard to, uh, to fathom, right? <laughs> I cannot even. I can't yeah. even think of what that would look like. And as a result, this moon is like Mustafar, but much, much worse. With an average surface temperature of negative 202 degrees Fahrenheit that can reach up to 2,900 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my god. So it is pretty inhospitable. Its atmosphere is completely gone. It's spewing lava all over the place. You know, good times. Vader would love it. So where does the life come in? <laughs> Seems like no life ever. Well, let's dive into that a little bit. So Dr. Schultz... Uh, Makuch recently wrote this perspective, like I said, and this isn't the first time they have voiced this idea as they wrote an article about it in Cosmology back in 2009. Now, the big question, like you said, how could life live here? Like, he's proposing life is here, but how? Well, there's a couple things. There may still be water and carbon dioxide under the surface, protected from the extreme environments. And some may ask, why is CO2 important? It's because microbes on Earth can use carbon dioxide to make organic compounds that contain carbon, such as sugars. And microbes could also possibly utilize the geothermal energy on the moon, more specifically the chemicals coming from the eruptions, such as the hydrogen sulfide. It's not unique, in fact, mitochondria has shown to utilize 
hydrogen sulfide to produce ATP or the energy of the cell in anaerobic conditions. And also hydrogen sulfide may also act as a substitute for water as it can dissolve organic compounds and it may actually be in liquid form under the conditions seen on the moon. Since there's a lot of volcanic activity, there should also be a lot of lava tubes as well in the moon. And for those that listen to the show regularly, we talked about lava tubes with Dr. Bick. And these tubes protect from radiation. They keep temperatures relatively constant. They can provide nutrients and they can trap moisture. Everything needed for microbes to live. And this has been observed on Earth, like I said. But in the end, Dr. Schultz Makuch does recognize that the plausibility is low and a lot of this is speculative, but it is theoretically possible. We haven't been able to like get there. None of our probes or anything have ever been anywhere close, right? Not to the surface. Not to the surface. This probe that's circling Jupiter, I think the closest it's got was like 900 something miles from the surface. So we've never had any opportunity to look at samples or anything like that, right? No, I think it took like... All speculation. Yeah. I think it took like at least six years for the probe just to reach Jupiter. Mm. And personally, if there is life out there, chances are that it would be very different than most of what we see here on Earth. Yeah, with all that sulfur? Yeah. All that temperature changes? And also... They mentioned that the surface is constantly being renewed or reshaped due to the volcanic activity. And because of this, I do wonder if lava tubes would last long enough to promote life. Or would the constant pressures of the moon, such as the tidal heating and the remodeling, be too much causing the lava tubes to be more of a transient structure, Mm -hmm. collapsing and disappearing relatively quickly? I would also like to mention that there has been a proposed mission that's under consideration by NASA. It's a probe called the Io Volcanic Observer, and it would image the moon's surface in greater detail as well as study the heat movement within the moon. And I think that that would pass by more like within 200 miles of the surface. So they're really looking to get high-quality images of the moon. And yeah, that, that it was a short, but I, I, I thought it was an interesting little speculation if life could live there and i never thought of hydrogen sulfide but i had to do a little bit of research and yeah the microbes there are microbes yeah that use hydrogen sulfide to produce energy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think that's what's sort of fun about astro microbiology is that so much of it is based off of theorizing and sort of trying to expand our own thinking that we have here on earth Mm mm-hmm do you know how long we've been thinking about Io? Is this as a species? Is this from Wikipedia? Uh huh. See if you if you unleash me on there. <laughs> no, how long? Since January eighth of sixteen ten by Galileo. Galileo was in sixteen ten. Yeah. Somehow I thought he was older. And I guess I've only ever heard his name, but according to this, his name is Galileo Galilei. Galileo Galilei. Yeah. It's kind of like Eric Erickson. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Well, Microbial Nation, that's the end of our show and the end of our segment on astromicrobiology, at least for now. Maybe in the future we'll bring it back if you so wish. I think it's so cool we should do it again sometime. Some someday I mean, we're too much of a nerds not to go back to space. I totally agree. Agreed. But before we go, we have a question for all of you, my dear listeners. What would you like to see as our next session or next season of the micro moment? I think we have a couple ideas here. John, do you have an idea of what we could do? I have several ideas. Oh boy, lay them on us. All right. Would you like us to do a segment on the other ohms that we don't hear about regularly. This is the mycome or fungal microbiome. Mm, Fungi, yeah. The virome or the microbiome comprised of viruses. So hot right now. Protists 
and how weird they are. Perpetually underrated. Very underrated. A whole section on extremophiles, which is tangentially related to this. Yeah, I could see it still being different. Yep. Uh, or maybe cool microbiology discoveries, such as an accidental one, one that benefits society, how they changed how we view microbiology or products that we use. Hmm, like penicillin? Penicillin. Or maybe... Do I get so obsessed with that stuff? Or how about how H. pylori was shown to be oh, the cause of ulcers? Yeah, we, we have talked about doing... Uh microbiologists that have tested on themselves and have helped microbiology for it, but you should never do self-experimentation. No. No. So also not use your neighbor's kids. Definitely not. Yeah. Or pets. Or pets, which has happened in the past. But that, that would be another idea that we have discussed and haven't done yet. Do you have any others, Tess? Um... My other idea, in addition to the one I just talked about, which was self-experimentation in microbiology, would be, hold on, I'm thinking, careers, careers in microbiology, where we'd interview people from a slew of different careers within microbiology and all the places you can go in microbiology, as well as dirty deeds by bad biologists, which is another idea that we've had for quite some time we haven't done, and this would be all about looking at some of the evil scientists who try to use microbes for evil intent. Yeah, I can go into some dark places. Oh, it's going to get real dark. Bioterrorism, bioexperimentations, money mongers, greedy, greedy biologists. Julie, what ideas do you have? Well, I have one. Uh, so I don't know if anybody else has been watching the The Last of Us, which is about really scary evolution of fungus. That basically that the the Earth has warmed up enough that fungus has figured out how to, instead of taking over ants and bugs' bodies, has figured out how to take human bodies over so like i think doing maybe a, the scariest evolutions of microbes that could continue on and really affect our futures would be kind of interesting mm, yeah that would be cool so those are our ideas you can cast your votes for these or other ideas you might have in three different ways and we'll probably narrow our ideas down to three to five so that it's not overwhelming to pick. But here are your ways that you can cast your vote. You can, one, hop over to our Instagram and in our stories in the highlights, if it's after the story's been aired in the highlights, there's a podcast section. You will see a story asking you to vote. You can vote there. You can head over to our Twitter. Yes, we still have a Twitter. We haven't jumped ship fully on that yet. And cast your vote on a poll we'll hold over there on our page. Or if you're not on social media, not a problem. I love you for it. We, you can go ahead and send us which vote, which idea you'd like us to do via email at microbials at gmail.com. So once again, let us know what you'd like us to cover next either on Instagram or Twitter at microbigals that's m i c r o b i g a l s or send us an email to microbigals at gmail.com we'll go ahead and collect all the responses figure out which one's the highest and come at you with our next season of the micro moment i can't wait to hear your responses oh i'm so excited i love we'd love to hear from you Fantastic. Well, we hope you enjoyed us from Microbiology. We look forward to calculating your votes and coming up with what is the next thing we're going to research because that's one of my favorite things to do. I love, I love me a good research, Sess. So until next time, feed your mind. Feed your guts. Make your microbes love you lots. Bye. Bye. Bye.